This Juno World Affairs Council presentation is a co-production with 360 North. It was recorded on March 13, 2014 at 360 in Juno. Mary Miller is an Alaskan who has been volunteering with the Peace Corps in Ukraine. The Peace Corps recently pulled Miller and more than 200 other volunteers out of the country over safety concerns. She had been there for 18 months. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here. I see a lot of familiar faces, and um, so I'm going to talk this evening about my experience in the Peace Corps in Ukraine. Um, I've put together a slideshow, um, so I'll be referring to this um, to follow the presentation. I ask that you, if you have questions, to keep them in mind and save them until the end. Um, and then there is a microphone that we ask you to use um, when you do have questions. So first to begin with, Dobro Pozhalovat. That's the extent of my Russian. No, I do know a little bit more, but that is how you say welcome in Russian. Um, and you can see on the, uh, present on the picture here, there is a truck. And that is Cyrillic alphabet, and it says Alaska. And I was in my dormitory room, looked out the window, and I'm learning Cyrillic. And I said, I think that says Alaska. <laughs> you know? And so of course, I immediately had to run down the four flights of stairs out to the back parking lot. There were two men uh, washing this truck that delivers water. And I had Alaska pins that I gave them. And I told them, my stadt Alaska. And I think they looked at me like I was a complete wild woman. <laughs> um, you know, what are you doing talking to us and giving us these pins? You know? um, but I was able to tell them my state was, from, was Alaska and that um, I am from there. So that was one of my first greetings after I went to site. Um, so and as you can see, I was there for about 18 months. So what I'm going to do is a brief history of Ukraine. Um, I'm not sure how much people know about it. I knew very little before I went over there. Um, so I will do a brief history. Um, I will also talk about the Peace Corps um, and my experiences there, challenges, rewards. Because I am still active in the Peace Corps, it is a non-political, non-religious organization. And therefore, I am not at liberty to discuss politics. I didn't when I was over there. Um, and that continues. So while I can ask, answer some questions about the culture and about my experience, I really can't get into the current situation. So I do ask that those questions maybe be saved for someone else who probably knows more than I do. But I will share what I am able to. So this is the. the country of Ukraine. Um, you can see there's a river that, it, this is the Dnieper, and it, it more or less divides, this, it runs through, it snakes through the country. Um, and a lot of times when they talk about the east and the west, that's one of the, the sort of informal dividing lines. Kiev is the capital, and some people say, why do you say Kiev? That is the Ukrainian pronunciation. The people of Ukraine, most of them, especially the youth, which is who I worked with, are bilingual. They can speak Russian and Ukrainian. They are taught Ukrainian in school. They speak Russian in the homes. So the pronunciation of the capital in Ukrainian is Kiev, and it is Kiev in Russian. This city in the left, on the, in the west, Ukrainian, it is pronounced Lviv. In Russian, it is Lvov. Odessa, they say it just their own way, and it's Odessa. And it took me about six months to learn how to say that correctly. A lot of people say Odessa, and then they know you're not from there. Um, so these are some of the major cities. Um, there's Chernobyl. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. And this city up here, Chernigiv, is where I first did my training for three months. So I lived in this town for three months and then moved to Odessa. <laughs> So Peace Corps, a lot of times when you think of Peace Corps, you think of Africa, a desert, a grass hut. Those kind of countries are what are referred to as developing countries. Peace Corps also serves in countries that are called, they're in transition. They have basic infrastructure, they have energy, they have transportation, they have healthcare, they have education, but they're in a major transition 
or they're trying to, to grow and develop in a specific area. Mexico is another country that has Peace Corps volunteers, but it's a country in transition. In Mexico City, in, in places, there is vast infrastructure. So that is one of the um, qualifications about serving in Ukraine, is that it is a country in transition. And it's the transition from being a Soviet state to an independent country, which it gained its independence in 1991-92. The history. Ukraine has had its borders changed. It's been under the rule of Lithuania, Austria-Hungary, parts of it have been under Poland. So it's been over six, seven hundred years it's had different rulers, different governments, um, and in the 19th century even, even more so, until the Bolshevik Revolution which was the, the beginning of the Soviet period, and that's when it became a Soviet state under the USSR. One of the qualifiers also when I speak about the uh, Soviet period, I will talk about some historical events that may, well they do have a very negative tone, negative things that happened, but I do want to say that not everything under the Soviet time was negative. I'm not saying positive or negative about that time, but I am going to point to some historical events that occurred that do have a negative um, view. So the first one I want to talk about is the Holodomor. I did not know anything about this until I went over there. This is a forced famine that took place under the Stalin regime and it occurred in 1932 and 1933. It's called the Great Famine and the word Holodomor translates to death by hunger. And it took the lives of between five and seven million Ukrainians. They literally, the armies and soldiers came in and literally took the animals, took the wheat, took the food, and literally starved the people to death. It was punishment because Ukrainians were very independent thinkers. They were farmers, they were used to markets and selling. And it was the collectivism that was in, was in the uh, conflict. So it was punishment for those who resisted collectivism and promoted individuality. Um, each year it is commemorated on <coughs> November 26th. There is no performance, no um, ballets or concerts. It's a very solemn time. And this is an event that is remembered throughout Ukraine. The Great Terror, again, was under Stalin, and it was with the collectivism, again, where many Ukrainians were arrested, shot, or sent to gulags and Siberi Siberian work camps. Many people that I met had family members who had experienced this, their grandparents, relatives of theirs. There are virtually no statues of Stalin in Ukraine. Um, it developed a great lack of trust. You didn't know who to trust, your neighbors. There were people that would report and you would just be missing. Um, you didn't even want to tell your children things because they might accidentally let something slip. Um, so this book is available in the Juno Library and I was reading it and it talks about this time and it's, it's interviews with people who um, lived it. So I did want to bring that up, The Whisperers. World War II, the entire country of Ukraine was occupied by the Nazis for three years. The, door, the building where I taught, once I was at placement, was a barracks for Nazis. Um, once again, everyone that we knew has stories about World War II. It's like it happened yesterday. Um, this is the May 9th celebration in Odessa, uh, where it's the, the monument to those that perished in the war there were literally hundreds of thousands of people, the veterans come, and children, teenagers, everyone will go up to a veteran and say thank you for your service and give them a flower. Um, and again, around the monument. Eight million Ukrainians perished, 2.3 were de deported to uh, Germany. As Gastabartas, it was forced labor, um, and they were occupied. Sixty 
cities were destroyed. Uh, Chernigov, where I did my training, was in the top five of the most damaged cities in World War II. It was pretty much flattened. Um, and one of the other things that happened during the war is as the Russians retreated, as they were giving that up, as the Nazis invaded, they often then destroyed things that could be of use to the Nazis. So it was, it was like a double whammy that as the Russians retreated, they destroyed things and then the Nazis came in. A recommended reading, Holocaust by Bullets. This was something, he is a French Jesuit priest and he is going around Ukraine at the present time and he's I interviewing the elders, the older people, and asking, were you here during the war? And he is getting the stories from them from when they were children. This Holocaust monument is in, it was down the street in Odessa from me. Um, there were, I believe, about 200,000 Jews living in Odessa at the time, and they were shipped off to camps, they were killed, um, and this is a monument to them. The, the slide on the right with the white circles, those are names of people who helped the, the Jews, um, and so it is a memorial to them because of what they risked in helping to save Jews. The left and the top is in a town called Ternopil. You will see these monuments where it is known things that happened. But the book Holocaust by Bullets now is un uncovering many mass executions where it was before the concentration camps were built, where the Nazis came in, took the Jews outside of town, and just killed them. So there are mass graves all over Ukraine, many that nobody even knows about and they are finding them now through these interviews and finding shell casing and, and things like that um, for evidence. The memorial on the bottom and the picture on the far right is a place just outside Kiev. It's called Baba Yar. And this is just, the, the picture on the left, or on the right, is just a finger to a huge ravine. And in that ravine, in one weekend, 10,000 Jews were killed. Over 100,000 were killed during that time. They would line them up and shoot, and they would fall in the ravine. So this is, um, there are many monuments in this area to those people. And then after World War II was the Cold War. These phrases that are listed, fear, pessimism, uh, critical thinking, ban on um, basic freedoms, these are phrases that many of the Ukrainian Peace Corps staff shared with us in their upbringing, how they describe themselves. In our cultural training, one of the things that they did was they wanted us to understand why people might behave a, a certain way. That They called it the stone face. When I was receiving my training in Chernigiv, it was very marked that when you're at the bus stop, nobody's talking to each other, when you're on the bus, nobody's talking. Everyone has this, you just mind your own business. That was something that through generations they learned that you do not draw attention to yourself. You keep things private. You do not share your views on things. That was through the Stalin period and then it continued on through the Iron Curtain. The fear from days before. Then there was the Afghanistan war. This was a monument in Odessa. While it was a Soviet war, people from Ukraine did fight in it. This is in Odessa. And shortly before I left, I was at this um, monument in this park. It's at, Shev at Shevchenko Park. And they had this entire buffet set up. And they were having the veterans from the war come. And it was a ceremony to honor. It was the 25th anniversary of the end of the war. Chernobyl nuclear disaster, April 26th. Most of you look like you may remember it or be old enough to remember it. Um, I don't have a lot of research about it, but um, apparently only 31 people died in the actual explosion right away. But they estimate that at least 4,000 died in subsequent years. 
Um, there's a video that, a documentary that's going to be coming out, um, and it's called Babushkas of Chernobyl. And it is about these group of women who were from there, and they decided to stay. So they have lived in what's called the dead zone. They farmed, they have animals, they have died from cancer, from thyroid, but there are still some remaining. And one of the remarkable things is that over 350,000 people were evacuated from this dead zone. Many of them had a harder time or died because of the, the lack of home, because of that displacement. Um, so they're finding it quite remarkable that some of these old ladies are living longer than people who were removed. And they talk about the spirit of what is home. One of the quotes from it is um, one of the women says, I know hung I can't see radiation, but I know hunger. And so to be at home, she's the self-proclaimed mayor of a town of eight. Um, so anyway, it's, it's quite remarkable, and I think it will be coming out in the near future. Corruption was probably the number one thing that we would hear from students, from the Ukrainian staff, everywhere. And one of the things I wanted to um, talk about with this is that it is on every level. It, is, it used to be in the schools where grades were bought. You just went and paid the teacher and you got your grade. Um, and you may, maybe you were a B or a C, but you wanted an A, so you paid a little more. It didn't mean that you didn't study or you weren't a student, but it was just a standard operating procedure. A friend of mine got her driver's license, and she said, I'm a good driver. I didn't pay for my license. And I asked students about it, and they said, many people just pay for their license. You don't take the test. You just pay for it. Um, and you hear stories about the, the police force where you can get out of a ticket. You just pay it directly. Um, and then all the way up into the federal government or the, the national government. But co corruption on the scale. So this is the, the country again. And I wanted to point out they, all of these little dividers, those are called oblasts. And it's similar to what we would consider a state. Um, but they are called oblasts, and there are 24 of them. Um, the government, I believe, is still centrally located in Kyiv and runs things through the oblast. That it's not as though the people at the local level um, necessarily elect all of the people that are running their oblast, that there is a, a, a large influence from the capital. So now I'll talk about Peace Corps. Um, I see some of you, I think, have been in the Peace Corps, so I don't know if some of the rules have changed um, or some of the, the factors. But um, So it took about a year, year and a half to apply. They do legal background, medical background, look at your education, your work experience. Uh, they look at where there's openings, what kind of services they're looking for in specific countries. Um, Peace Corps serves only in countries that want Peace Corps volunteers. So the host country has to say, yes, we want Peace Corps volunteers. The host country also says, and this is what we want them to do. There are different kinds of volunteers. Ukraine has three slash four kinds. The first one, I was TEFL. That's teaching English as a foreign language. Youth development works with uh, maybe children and orphans or Boy Scout kind of groups, after school activity programs. Um, and community development might work more with the smaller villages on things. Maybe in the villages they, they don't have a good waste collection system or recycling or um, different things like that. So that's the type. There's a new kind of Peace Corps um, volunteer and it's called Peace Corps Response. You can be a previous Peace Corps volunteer, or you don't have to be. Um, these placements are generally f five to 12 months long, and you apply for a specific position that's called Peace Corps response. You do not get three, three months of language training. You come with a specific skill that they are looking for. So they, they may waive you know, a language requirement and, and have a translator for you, if your skills are something that they're looking for. So that there were also Peace Corps response volunteers in Ukraine. Uh, the usual term is 27 months. 
three months of training, and then two years at site. Um, since Ukraine became a country and asked for Peace Corps volunteers, 2,740 of them. I don't know if that includes us, but there were approximately 230 of us who were evacuated a few weeks ago. The groups before had actually even been larger. We um, just, like in November, about 90, I believe, Peace Corps volunteers had finished their two years, so they had left before this. My experiences. I've talked about this pre-service training. Um, it is vigorous. It is by far the most difficult thing I have done in a long time. It is six days of language training for four and five hours, cross-cultural training, learning how to ride a bus, how to buy things at the market, the money system, the Cyrillic alphabet. One of the things about language is our, my group was 61 volunteers when we arrived. And the group is divided. Some will learn uh, Ukrainian and some will learn Russian. They will receive that education. I received a little bit of training in Ukrainian. Uh, but for the most part, my lessons were, uh, were uh, to learn Russian, which meant I was most likely going to be in the southern or the eastern part. And those learning Ukrainian were going to be in the central or the western part of Ukraine. Um, we learn um, the volunteers teach at all levels of school. So there are some that are specializing or learning about elementary school, some are secondary. The mature volunteers, which is what we call us, um, we were asked um, to teach at university level. When I first went over there, I was going to teach post-secondary. Um, and then on the bus ride from Kiev to, Chern to Chernobyl, to Chernigiv, um, she asked some of us um, if we would switch, that they had more demand for university than they had volunteers. Um, and so they asked us to switch. And so I was teaching. Uh, so I learned about the university system um, and different teaching methodologies. One of the things they talk about is communicative approach. It's not doing lecture format. It's getting students involved in things, using music, different mediums. Um, and then one of the things, we are not required as TEFL volunteers to do a community project, but they want us to be aware of it and that we can do secondary projects um, if something presents itself as a need and we're interested in it, but it is not required. My host family, on the, on the right, um, I lived with Valentina and Yari is her son. Um, and then her mother would come in from the village and often was selling potatoes at the bazaar and would stay. That is my room um, at the top left. And this is the typical housing that you will see um, throughout most of Ukraine. Um, I believe it's called, I, I forget what, it has a nickname for it, but they are five stories high. They are all exactly the same. Um, and part of it was to meet the need for housing after World War II. I think they're Khrushchev blocks. And it was because there were a lot of homeless people. Everything was destroyed. We need housing. So they did. They had this, this plan, this format, and so you see these very same buildings all over. You can go in one and go in another and the layout is exactly the same. These are the two people responsible for our training. Um, Tamila on the left was our language coach. She had the patience of a saint. Um, working with the mature volunteers that didn't learn as fast as maybe the younger ones. Um, that is my cluster um, on the right. Uh, we actually started with six um, and we lost one who had to leave because of medical reasons. Um, and this was our classroom and the walls were covered with every day she'd add more. <laughs> um, but it's survival Russian. It's learning body parts, transportation, hello, goodbye. I want to do this, I am lost, help me please, I don't understand you. Um, learning how to say those things in Russian. I think a lot of times my face did the talking, but um, smile and a handshake. So it was very intensive training. Masha on the right, she organized different community events, um, concerts, um, worked with us at the university, the education, um, and so she, it was a, co-team taught as far as training us, and, and their hands were full with us. 
Uh, this is the top picture is a picture from Kiev and it has what's called the Lavra, the church in the background. The museum on the right um, is the Holodomor Museum about the forced famine. This church was right down the street from me. When I walked by it every day when I went to training in Chernigiv. And this woman was selling her wares in Kiev. She is Ukrainian from the West. Um, and that um, needlework or that pattern is called Vishivanka. Again, concerts. Um, kind of difficult to see, but the middle one is a hand with an apple cut out of it. And it was a monument to Steve Jobs that was right around my academy um, in Odessa. And, and the man that, that built it was, he loved him. So when he died, he built that to his honor. And then this is um, a statue of Tar Shevchenko. And he is a famous author, poet, um, Ukrainian from the 19th century. And there are statues of him all over Ukraine. Every town I would go, oh, I have to get my picture of Taras, you know. So I have many pictures of him. This was one of the churches, um, an extremely old church. And in the back of it, it had a wishing stone where we often made wishes that might have dealt with Russian fluency a few times. And, um, down on the bottom left, uh, we went to sauna. Uh, it's part of those cultural integration, and that's the river we would go into, the Desna, um, which is in Chernigiv, um, and that's Deb. She was in my cluster. And just some of the sights that you would see on any given day. You could be walking in the city and come across a babushka with uh, some young girls and goats, and the sunflower is prevalent everywhere. Um, they grow it in the fields. And this is just a bushel of tomatoes. Um, they are very proud of their black earth. Um, during World War II, the Germans literally trucked up the soil and took it back to, to Germany. It is so rich. Um, and, and the gardening, the vegetables taste so good. Um, and everyone has a dacha. That is your summer home. Um, if you don't live in the village, if you're living in a city, most of the people I knew had what's called a dacha, and they would have their gardens there where they would go, they would plant, and everyone has their own fruits and vegetables, and they are wonderful. So this is a picture of my academy and my students, uh, and I taught what was called English for Communication. It's a telecommunications um, academy, so a lot of computer people, um, systems analysts, system programmers. I would walk into classrooms and look at these equations on the wall and go, you understand this stuff? And they did, and they, they would say, um, do you know how a phone works? And I'd say, no, and they'd go, we do. And so they, they also I taught the technical elite students. And so they had a fairly high level of English, but often it was in their head and not coming out of their mouth. When it did come out of their mouth, it was British English often. And so I asked the students what they wanted to learn as far as English goes. They wanted to know about American culture, American holidays, idioms, phrases, things like that. And so that's what I would base my lessons on. But the goal of my class was to get them to talk. So whether we would be talking about stereotypes of Americans, stereotypes of Ukrainians, it would be to get them to talk and use the English that was in their heads. Couldn't do it without these people. The woman in red is my counterpart. She is a volunt she's Ukrainian. Uh, she is volunteer from the academy. And she was appointed by the academy to help me. Um, if I had difficulty in scheduling, if I couldn't find something. I lived in the dormitory, if there were problems there, she would help me. She called me her naughty niece <laughs> because she would find out I went on a bus someplace and, oh, you did that already, you're not ready, you know. She was, because they take it very serious. She was my caretaker, um, but she was wonderful. And that is her husband and her son. And the woman on the right, um, Tatiana, was my regional manager. Um, she was responsible for two of those oblasts and all of the Peace Corps volunteers in them. So if there were site problems or issues, but also training or reports that we had to do, she was my contact in the Peace Corps staff. One of the things about Peace Corps, the main office is in Kyiv. It's 
probably 50 to 75 people at the very least, of which three are Americans. The rest are Ukrainian. It is their program to run under the oversight of the director and a finance person and a program person. But, but the medical staff, the drivers, the security, the language specialists, the education specialists, um, they are all Ukrainian. And they are absolutely wonderful. I, I, I think we all just have the highest esteem for them. The students, um, first generation to grow up in an independent Ukraine. Um, you know, I'd show up for class and somebody would bring a, a saxophone. You know, okay, we're going to listen to some music today, I guess. Um, studying and then going on um, field trips or excursions with the students and they gave me the, the wreath. Uh, that was the street I lived on, Staroporto Frankovskaya. <laughs> Took me a while to learn that one. I don't think there were any words less than 12 letters. In addition, I taught, so I taught five classes to students, three classes to teachers who wanted to study English, and I did English club for all of the other students. It was anyone who wanted to come from the academy, and I would do that two nights a week. And that would be more fun. We would play games, we might do a Halloween party. We would do things, not like homework kind of things, but um, more just fun. So they were all learning about the Iditarod before I left. <laughs> Another thing I wanted to point out was Windows on America. This is a program that's run through the State Department, and I believe there were 20 centers in Ukraine. And there was an active um, Windows on America center at, in Odessa at the Gorky Library. Um, so I went there, that, well they had documentaries on Tuesday night where an American would show a documentary and then they would discuss it. Thursday night was read a short story, come prepared, discuss it. Saturday was film club, watch an English language film with English subtitles most of the time, discuss it. And then the librarian asked um, me to do game day. They had these games that nobody was using. And some of them were um, using language and some were just fun. So as long as we were together and talking, it was seen as beneficial. So these are some of the people from that group. Odessa is where I lived. Um, it was a place that most everyone would have loved to have been, and when they told me it was my placement, I panicked. It was a large city, and I said, that's the one thing that makes me nervous, living in a city. So they put me in 1.2 million. Um, it was an adjustment. I kept looking for green space, kept looking for quiet, kept looking for an Alaskan beach. Wasn't going to find it there. Um, but I did come to learn and love the culture. It has an opera hall. This is um, the Philharmonic. The major holiday, I mean, they have many holidays, but the big one they're famous for is Humorina, and it's on April 1st, April Fool's Day. Um, the Potemkin Steps, for any of you uh, video or movie uh, buffs, that is a famous a uh, place from Battleship Potemkin. It's a black and white movie and got a famous scene in it. And probably what Odessa is most famous for is its beaches, um, which in the summer they can be so crowded you can hardly see the sand. It is on the Black Sea. The other thing the Peace Corps does is summer camps. Um, and this they work generally with like maybe 10 years old at the youngest maybe in some day camp kind of things, to up to 21, 22, depending on the sophistication of the camp. And this is a, a big part of what volunteers do during their summer months when school is not in session. So I wanted to point out two of them that I volunteered at. The first was Camp Model United Nations. It was the first time Peace Corps had put this on in Ukraine. Uh, universities had done them within their university, but this was open to all Ukrainians. Um, youth. Um, it was done in English. We floundered a little bit in the beginning learning parliamentary procedure and they're like, you want me to say what? And we didn't know what it meant. So, but it was an amazing experience and after five days they were standing up passing resolutions and um, it, was, it was quite amazing. Camp Nika, I volunteered. It was over in western Ukraine um, on the border with Romania. Um, and maybe Slovakia is over there as well. Um, 
And this was where they have a refugee uh, settlement, uh, camp, center, where they are helping refugees from Somalia, Afghanistan, Syria, um, find their status or get their status as a refugee, um, integration into the community once you have that. Um, and this camp was working with the children who were at those centers and Ukrainian youth so they could learn about each other's cultures. Um, they see them on the streets, you see them around, let's, straight, let's start building those um, bridges. Again, a wonderful experience. These are some of the other camps um, that Peace Corps sponsors. We also do this, it isn't just Peace Corps volunteers, it is also Ukrainian volunteers. So when we did the Model United Nations, I was Colombia, and I had a Ukrainian staff or volunteer who was also Colombia, and then we had three campers who, and we represented the country of Colombia, and then somebody else was Germany, and somebody else was this country, and we did a mock United Nations, learning about it and how it works. So these are some of the other topics that are promoted. Just some slides, active, critical thinking, not just memorizing and reciting. Being involved in your community. AIDS awareness, HIV. Ukraine has one of the highest rates, fastest growing. Um, and so a lot of work and a lot of effort is being in to bring that back. Healthy lifestyles, a lot of people still smoke. Alcoholism, some of the, the same problems we have. Um, but working on promoting healthy lifestyles. Volunteerism, getting involved in your community. And the challenges that they face. Um, this was out my back door. And I would often see pensioneers, is what they were called. They would be going through the dumpsters looking for food, things. Um, sometimes they were feeding the animals. There were also a lot of street dogs, street cats, cats that all seemed to be very well um, cared for. Rule of law, the corruption again infrastructure, the roads, sidewalks, things like that, that just need a lot of repair and work. And so this is some of our group um, at DC who uh, we evacuated together with. Um, I was group 44. Um, the last group to come into country was group 40, 46. Um, and group 47 has been reassigned. So while in D.C. during our transition conference, I found the Tara Shevchenko Monument in Washington, D.C. And so a group of us went and lit some candles there. And um, there's a lengthy thing about the, uh, the statue there, but I wanted to. The statue is dedicated to the liberation, freedom, and independence of all captive nations. Tara Shevchenko. 19th century Ukrainian poet and fighter for the independence of Ukraine and the freedom for all mankind. So on that, that will be the end of my presentation. Um, I do have a short video that I would like you to watch and then we'll take questions. Best ideas come at 3 a.m. I can see the start, not the end. I said, sail through a black sea of paper. And all my friends said that I was mad because I peddled away everything I had. I don't care what I've lost, because I know what I've got. Mom, I'll be safe. Dad'll make you proud. Think it's time for me to head on. Dasadanya, it means goodbye. Dasadanya, and I hate to see you cry. Dasadanya, what a little child. Dasadanya, giant. Hello, close line. Yeah. 
Jetsy running up and down the hall Breaking up the little classroom brawl It's a simple present tense Am I making any kind of sense? And then the troop cuts pickpockets Nuke the rain Margarita, pizza, bears, mayonnaise Tell me how did I get here? And the Zocal I mean near The stone at the linen and the Bolsheviks Cold war famine and the whole damn mix What is the solution? It's a, a bowl of oranges and a revolution So that that video was made by a man named Caden Mayfield. Um, he and his wife were uh, Peace Corps volunteers very close to where I lived um, in the town of Ilichosk, um, and he was on the Black Sea as well. So, any questions? Oh, um, please use the mic. Yeah. Um, what kind of education system do they have? Is it is it structured? Is it a class system so that some students and kids are steered toward the trades and some are steered toward university? And is the elementary system advanced? Are they well educated there now? You know, I can, I can talk a little bit about the, I'm certainly not an ed, uh, expert in that. One of the things that I found was interesting um, and different than ours um, is that, well, they're called forms instead of grades. So first form, second form, third form. For the first four years, the students will have the same teacher. So the teacher is their teacher for those first four years, um, and they develop a real, uh, you know, love for this teacher. Um, after that, it will change, but they will still have maybe a homeroom teacher that stays with them throughout of it, throughout their education. Um, I I believe they can choose, you know, their their careers, their paths, their chosen profession. Um, at the same time, I met students who were doing telecommunications because they wanted a good job. They really would like to play saxophone, but they needed a good job. So I think some of that is the same. Um, their, their education system, um, you know, they, they need new books, they need new technology, they, the chalkboards, um, you know, at the academy where I taught, you know, many you could barely write on. Um, so they need a lot of support in that way. Things are old, they're run down, they don't have the latest um, technology, um, maybe not the best libraries, the newest books. Um, but as far as the individual students go, I do believe they can choose their career and, and their path. Just a little clarification. If I understood you correctly, you said uh, at the beginning of the talk that, that everyone speaks Russian at home and they study Ukrainian in school? No. No, okay, then no. I misunderstood. Um, no, so Ukrainian, since independence and since it became a country, Ukrainian is the official language. So they teach it in the schools so that everyone is learning Ukrainian um, for those that grow up in a Russian-speaking house. But no one is prevented from speaking Russian um, but they are teaching them, and so the children that I knew, the youth that I met, had received, if they grew up in a Russian-speaking household, they could still communicate and understand most of the Ukrainian because they'd received it in school. Um, but you still speak whatever language. There's also one, um, it's called Surgic, and it's the blend of Ukrainian and Russian that, yeah, the, the people that are in those communities, they're like, I don't know what I'm learning. <laughs> I'm not asking you to take sides, but mm -hmm. what did you see in Odessa in the way of demonstrations or other things reflective that there was political unrest in the country? In, in Odessa, I didn't see much. Um, I was there um, during the Euromaidan, and most of it really was located in Kyiv. Um, we were also instructed, though, that if you saw something, if you saw a large gathering, get away, um, just to avoid any sort of perception of a conflict or that 
we're supporting one side or the other. So if there was a demonstration of sorts, I would have left, but I never even saw that. I just have one observation. I was in Czechoslovakia in the 70s after the Prague Spring, and what you described with the people, drab clothing, not looking at each other, not communicating, with the exception of the children. The children had colors and things like that, but that's the only place you saw it, a very similar reaction to the situation. Yeah. Thank you. Mary, what was your personal motivation in going? Did you choose uh, Ukraine, or were you assigned there? And how did things work out for you? Oh, I, I'm very glad that I was there. Um, no, with Peace Corps, you do not get to choose your country. And even within the country, I did not get to choose where I, where I got to go. Um, but you, it's a long process during the application. So you're talking with a recruiter. They're asking, well, do you have any preferences? They're looking at your background. They want you to succeed, so they don't want you to be completely out of your element and miserable. Um, so they do try to match you with your interests, your abilities, and what, what they're looking for. Um, I knew very little about Ukraine before I went there. Um, the reason I wanted to go in the Peace Corps, you know, it's a difficult um, thing to, to answer because you think, oh, I'm such a good person, I want to go save the world. I went for selfish reasons. I wanted to live in another culture. I had done it once before. Um, I had lived in Honduras, and I wanted to do it again. And Peace Corps offers that opportunity and does so in a non-religious, non-political environment. I, can, I agree with their principles, their goals. Um, the goals of, of Peace Corps, one, are to meet the needs of the country. What does the country want you to do? So you're performing that service. So we receive training and teaching English. I tried to do that to the best of my ability. The other goals of Peace Corps are for me to learn about Ukraine, another way to look at the world. One of the things that I found difficult was the indirect communication. They don't tell you anything directly the way, you know. So you're constantly trying to figure out what's going on, and nobody's going to tell you directly. And I was going to do a lesson on it, and I'm going to tell them all the good things about direct communication. And I looked it up, and it was like, oh, really? <laughs> Indirect communication has its place. Um, and actually, there's times where we as Americans could be too direct, and it can be seen as offensive. That really, you didn't need to be as blunt or as direct, that maybe an indirect method of communication would have gotten the same result in maybe a better fashion. So while I was there, I was learning about myself and also learning new ways of looking at things um, that maybe we don't always do things the best. Um, they have a very strong um, sense of family and you always saw people with baby buggies. Um, one of the things I would have loved to show you was they, they have these just like uber baby carriages. They're just amazing all over the country. And in Odessa, they had a decorated baby carriage competition. <laughs> and I had to walk all over trying to find it, but I found it. And I've got pictures from that, and, and it was quite amazing. I can honestly say there was not a single day that didn't go by that I didn't, that something didn't happen that didn't make me smile. Um, I'll stare, share a story until somebody stands at the uh, mic. So, they're street animals and um, street dogs. They're not little ones. These are 50, 60, 70 pound dogs. Um, one day I was walking and there was a babushka. We are told if you're ever in any problem, go to them, they'll help you. Well, I saw her sitting over there and she had a dog near her and I passed by and, and just minding my own business, not bothering anybody. And then these three dogs are like barking and they are gonna eat me alive. So I'm backing up and I'm, you know, and she's, then she starts telling me, go ahead, go ahead. And I'm like, no. <laughs> um, she gets up, she grabs me by the arm, and we go walking. She goes, dun, dun. she says something to the dogs. They lie down. And we walked right through them. And then, das vidanya. And I'm like, spasiba bolshoi. <laughs> you know? Things like that just happened all the time um, as far as fond memories. So I'm glad I was there. You showed some uh, great photos of churches in uh, parts of uh, the Ukraine. What role does uh, religion and church play in Ukrainians' uh, current society? I, th I think it's a very important um, part in that I, most of the people I met 
belong to either the Russian Orthodox or the Ukrainian Orthodox. Um, I imagine like in our culture, you have your Christmas, Easter, um, maybe people that just go to church on those days, but they have wonderful traditions and ceremonies. Um, I wish I was going to be there this year for Easter because I didn't know about it last year. But they will get up at two in the morning, one in the morning, and you go to the church and you take this basket that has very specific meat, wine, bread, cheese, very specific things in it. And the whole community is coming to the church to get their basket blessed in the middle of the night. And they will light candles and it will be all outside. I didn't know what was going on. I was sleeping through it this year. Um, so their, religion, I, I believe, plays a very important part. Did you have any sense that the corruption was so prevalent that it was considered appropriate in any way? Or did people actually think of it as wrong, but it was so common that everybody just did it? I think it's that latter. Um, I, I don't know that I met anybody that didn't talk about it. But there was also the can't do anything about it. Just the way it is, this is the way it works. Um, kind of attitude. Um, but there were people that wanted it to not be that way. I paid for my, I didn't pay for my license. I took the test. I passed. I'm a good driver. Um, the school, the education system, they were setting up um, independent reviews for graduation to get your certification. Rather than just having the teacher give the grade, you had to pass an you know, independent uh, review to get your, your degree. You mentioned the dachas outside town. Are those like a cabin on Shelter Island, or are those like a, a second on, home on the water? But yeah, they're they're just small, small homes. Um, maybe with a with a stove. Um, people may live in them, um, but many would just go during the summer. They they would have their primary residence maybe in the city, and then go to their dacha in the summer. Because I've heard of them in Russia as some place where oligarchs go to. Spend fancy I imagine time. they have nicer dachas. <laughs> and it, does, it, does it mean summer home? I mean, what's I think that's you? what it means. Okay. That's just what it was called. Mary, did you have any experience with the health care system there, or a sense of how? <laughs> I did. How effective and it was? so I um, at at Camp Model United Nations, I was sitting on the beach, minding my own business, talking to a student. And they were playing volleyball behind us. And the volleyball came and it hit my foot and broke my toe. So they want you to document everything that happens. I know you can't do anything to a broken toe. but um, So it was very convenient that my counterpart's husband was a doctor. So I asked her for her help. You know, Peace Corps wants me to go and get an x-ray of my toe. Um, and so it was very convenient because he then picked me up in their car, took me to the clinic. I went in front of like 20 people. <laughs> got my x-ray, the report, and I was back home in my dormitory in 45 minutes. That would have been an all-day ordeal, and I, I don't know that I could have accomplished it on my own. Um, but the, there is a mechanism, and I, and I knew people that went to the clinic and received treatments. They were happy with their treatment. One of the things, uh, one of, a recent conversation I had was that you choose your doctor a lot by word of mouth, that who is the good one, um, much like we do here. Um, so yeah, I think there's very you know good quality health care when you can get it, um, and just you got to have the time a lot of times. Any other? You mentioned the teachers stay with their students for the first four years in school. Are those teachers generally women? Or are they both sexes? How does that work? Oh, I would think mostly women, um, but I, I was at the university level, so I don't have as much knowledge about the, the early years. Before all the changes that started happening recently, what kind of attitude did people have towards Russia? Was it, you know, this is our, our brother, you know, this is part of it, or, you know, sort of negative? You know, I don't know. Um, there was definitely a pride in, in being independent, in, in being an independent Ukraine. Um, and so, I mean, I didn't necessarily hear any animosity or anything negative beforehand. Um, but it was more pride in being an independent country. Okay. Oh. 
how much time did you have to pack up? Uh, well, the long or the short. We, there, with safety and security, um, during a lot of the protests and things, we were on just heightened awareness to be aware um, of what's going on and, and there were travel restrictions and things like that. Um, we, I only received less than 24 hours of the actual evacuation. Um, but that isn't to say that there weren't things that happened beforehand that, I mean, I never thought I was going to be evacuated. Up until the time I was getting on the plane, um, I just didn't think it was going to happen. Um, but you, I was putting things together at, uh, you know, certainly for, for a quick trip or to one of the things is called consolidation where you may just stay for a little while um, someplace. Do, do many families have cars? And if so, are they Russian, Eastern country, Western cars? Um, I would say the majority of people do not have cars. I, I once asked my students how many of your families have cars, and I think it would be like two out of 15 had a car. Um, I was in Odessa, so it there I saw Audis, and I saw Bentley Convertible, you saw BMWs, and you saw Ladas, and you saw Skodas, and you saw the full gamut. Um, but it is a very cosmopolitan town. Do they take a bus then to the dacha? Yes, you have, um, it's called a marshrutka, and it probably took me a month to learn how to say that word correctly. And they are, they are small buses. Um, and those are in-city transport as well as between cities. Uh, the main mode of transportation between large cities, so when I would go to Kiev, I would ride the train. Um, and in the video, that was um, the Odessa train station and, and the train that I would ride. Um, I would ride third class, um, which was an open, um, it wasn't, there wasn't a compartment with a door. Um, but you still had a bench, they were very comfortable, um, they gave you sleeping things, you could get fresh linens, you got a pillow, um, they actually were very comfortable. Um, but the transport between cities is generally on buses. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap it up. And um, for those of you that would like to stay for a little while, um, we do have some additional videos. Um, one is of um, some students that they made for me. Um, so we'll show that, but it'll be off air. So thank you very much. And um, Miller spoke about her experience in Ukraine as a Peace Corps volunteer in this Juno World Affairs Council presentation. It was produced in collaboration with 360 North and recorded on March 13, 2014 at 360 in Juno.